Thanks for spending an hour of your evening with me. My name is Matt Hilton. I'm a family physician and also a sports medicine physician uh, with Lakeshore Health Partners. I practice in Zeeland um, on Chicago Drive. Our building is attached to the urgent care there, so if you're not familiar where that is. Talking tonight about diabetes, mainly focusing on type 2. We'll touch briefly on type 1 and also prediabetes, which comes before that. Um, but uh, talking about what it is, and then uh, we're going to spend a lot of time on how to prevent it and how do you treat it with lifestyle. Just by show of hands, who here is um, either personally diagnosed or has a family member with diabetes? Okay, lots of us. So very relevant, um, not speaking to people who don't care. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here, right? Okay, so here's our goals for tonight. What is diabetes? I'm gonna explain a little bit about what it actually is. Type one versus type two. How do we diagnose it? What are the symptoms? Why is it even important? What are, we, what are the treatments? And most importantly, how do we prevent this? So if we look in the dictionary, if you look this up, uh, Miriam Webster tells us that it's a serious disease where the body cannot properly control the amount of sugar in the blood because it doesn't have enough insulin. So to sum that up, my summary with arrows is too much blood sugar, not enough insulin. That's what's going on. So in med school, we're taught to understand the normal before we can understand what's abnormal. So normal digestion, our guy over here, this is his digestive tract. When he eats, food goes down into the stomach, and that's recognized by the pancreas, which is this tiny little organ. And if you feel on yourself, it's underneath your breastbone at the top of your belly. Okay. So when we eat, our blood sugar goes up. Okay. The pancreas recognizes that and it says, hey, we need to produce more insulin and distribute this blood sugar to the body so that it can use this fuel to go to the muscles, the brain, the heart, all your vital organs. And then that not only does that distribute it correctly, but it also keeps the blood sugar at a normal level. When there's not enough blood sugar, so if we're fasting or sleeping or not eating for a long period of time, the pancreas also recognizes that and says, hey, blood sugar's too low, we need to make some of our own to keep things okay. And it does that with a substance called glucagon. So glucagon says the body make more, in, more blood sugar and insulin says distribute the blood sugar that's out there. Okay. So that's what it is in, a, in general terms. Let's talk about type 2 versus type 1. Type 1 is fairly straightforward. It's an autoimmune disease, which means the body is attacking itself in some way. In this case, the body is attacking the pancreas, this little guy down here we talked about. So therefore, it can't produce insulin at all. How do we treat that? We give them more insulin. It's fairly straightforward. Type 2 is more confusing or just more complex, I should say. Um, it's got multiple factors that go into it. It's usually a cause of too many calories, mainly carbohydrates, not enough, or sorry, insulin not being recognized by the body, which we call insulin resistance, and then not enough insulin production, as well as too much glucagon production. Remember those two substances we just talked about. So they're acting um, not as they should or not being recognized as they should. So because of this, we have multiple ways of treating it and multiple targets we need to, to uh, focus on when we're treating this disease. I also wanted to bring up a couple of old terms that we don't really use anymore because they're confusing or inaccurate. Juvenile diabetes is, when people say that, it's generally referring to type 1 diabetes. We don't use that term anymore because that can be diagnosed from youth all the way up into 40s. Um, so it's not really used anymore. Insulin-dependent diabetes is confusing as well because a type 1 diabetic always needs insulin and a type 2 diabetic can sometimes be dependent on insulin as well. And then sugar diabetes is also not a useful term at all because both of them deal with high blood sugar, so I don't really know what that means. This is just a summary of what we were talking about, how type 2 diabetes is multifactorial. You've got too much uh, carbohydrates and calories going in. You've got uh, too much uh, glucagon producing too much sugar by the body. We don't have enough insulin being produced, and the insulin that is being produced isn't being recognized by the body. So all those things contributing to our high blood sugar. This is how we diagnose, this should say diabetes and prediabetes. Um, the numbers are not important for you to remember. It's just 
helping you understand how we do this. So fasting blood sugar on the left, that's what your blood sugar is at this point in time. So if a nurse pokes your finger or if you poke your own finger, um, that's what your blood sugar is at that second. Hemoglobin A1C is what is your three month average of blood sugars over the last three months. So if somebody comes in with blood sugar that's high, like I could mow down on candy bars right now and I'd have a sky high blood sugar, but if you took my A1C, it would be normal, okay? So the A1C helps us confirm what's going on with the blood sugar. The blood sugar also tells us, it helps us figure out what's going on after somebody eats, what's going on when somebody's fasting. And so they're both used different ways, but this is kind of the two, ba two main blood tests that we look at. All right, what are the symptoms, what are the risks? So you may be asking yourself, could I have diabetes, could I have prediabetes? The answer is yes, you could, but I feel fine, you say. It doesn't really matter, because once you have symptoms of these diseases, it's oftentimes too late or the horse is out of the barn. The classic symptoms with diabetes are excessive thirst, excessive urination, um, numbness tingling, oftentimes in the fingertips and hands, or in the, in the toes, blurry vision, fatigue, unexplained weight changes. Again, all these things happen after the disease has either been going on too long or it's just too severe. So a good example of this, why um, you could have this and not know about it, only 19% of pre-diabetics are diagnosed. That means 81% of the pre-diabetics in this country People who are at risk of becoming diabetic don't even know they have it. Okay, so you're saying I don't have symptoms, great, but what are my risk factors? Let's, we need to know these. Age is a risk factor, being over the age of 45. I think almost everybody in this room is over the age of 45. Not, not being white, okay? Um, even though uh, we are pr predominantly white Dutch Holland, it doesn't mean we're not at risk, okay? Um, but the higher risk races are um, Hispanics, African Americans, and um, Asian Americans. Metabolic syndrome. This is a collection of problems that all put um, somebody at risk of having type 2 diabetes. Um, excessive weight or obesity, having high blood pressure, having low HDL, which is your good cholesterol. I tell my patients to think that H means happy. So HDL is your good one. Um, high triglycerides, which is another type of cholesterol floating around in our bloodstreams. And impaired glucose tolerance, which is what we were talking about earlier, where the body doesn't recognize insulin the way it should. So all those things together um, are in the category, of, or make up the category of metabolic syndrome. Inactivity, Americans don't move enough. Pokemon Go is helping us move more, but we still need to move more. Um, a family history of diabetes. That does put us at risk, but it's not a death sentence. Just because somebody in your family or a direct relative has diabetes, it does not guarantee your fate as a diabetic. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS. Uh, you may have heard of this. Um, it's in females, um, obviously, because it's ovarian. And um, the medications that we use to treat diabetes are oftentimes the same as what we use to treat PCOS, so they go hand in hand. And then personally having gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is diabetes that develops in a pregnant female who didn't previously have diabetes. Um, and then even after she delivers, um, loses, loses the baby weight and gets back to a normal blood sugar, that female is still at risk of developing type two diabetes later in life. So of these risk factors, the ones in red, I don't know how well you can see the red, but metabolic syndrome and inactivity, those are the things that we can control by and large, okay? So that's why it's important to talk about prevention and treatment with lifestyle, which we will continue to go to. So why is this important? Why do we even care about this? Let's look at our country starting in 20 years ago. So 1996, this is the prevalence of diabetes in adult Americans. So a lot of states in the uh, less than four and a half category, less than four and a half percent of their population having diabetes. The South leading the way with uh, six and a half or six to seven and a half percent. So let's click through these and see how we trend. 
over the years. It's not looking good. Okay, this is 16 years ago. Vermont and Alaska holding out at less than 4.5%, but everybody else is weighing in with a lot more diabetes. And now we have a new color with Mississippi at over 9%. We keep going, we keep going. See where we're going with this? 10 years ago, <clears throat> we have a lot more states over 9%. Michigan, bumping it up to 7.5 to 9%. Keep going. This is the last big slide that I have, and then I have a summary one. But look at, look at the trend. It's just exploding compared to that first one you saw 20 years ago in 96. No state anymore is in the 4.5 category, whereas before a lot of them were about half the states. Oh, there we go. This is the summary slide, and the top one is our country and the uh, rates of obesity trend, and the bottom one is our rates of diabetes. I'll let you take that in and look at the similarities between the two maps. It continues to be a worsening problem. This is an interesting slide I found. 19, 1980 to 2000, just in 20 years, obesity rates doubled in our country. In just 20 years. And then using that slide and looking at these two numbers, this is looking at prediabetes. Again, the people who are at most at risk of developing diabetes. Over a third of our adults have prediabetes. And of our adults over age 45, remember that's our higher risk age group, 40%. So I keep telling you these statistics. I keep telling you it's a problem. But why is it a problem? Like, why do we care about it? Why are we hanging out here instead of watching the Olympics and hanging out at the beach? This is why it's a problem. Long-term effects of uncontrolled diabetes. It's the number one cause of blindness in our country. Number one cause of kidney failure in our country. The rates of, or the risk of having a stroke or a significant heart disease is two to four times what, that, what you would have without it. People, or 60 to 70% of diabetics have some form of nervous system damage, usually neuropathy, like the numbness, tingling, the pain in the extremities. And then people who get amputations outside of accidents or trauma, 60% of those are because of diabetes. Okay, and if all that is not enough to get your attention, that will too. Men, between a third and a three-fourths of you with diabetes, sexual dysfunction, and it affects the partners too, indirectly. This is just another slide looking at it from a cost standpoint. So the big number at the top, 30, 322 billion a year for diabetes and prediabetes in our country. Not only directly treating it, but the complications related to it. So you tell me, have we answered this question? Is it important? Absolutely. All right, what are the treatments? I'm gonna be brief here in the treatment category because Individualized treatments with medications needs to be a discussion between the patient and their doctor. There's a lot of different medications out there, a lot of new ones that are very exciting and better than what we've had in the past. Um, and I'm just going to kind of briefly touch base on that so you're at least aware of what's out there. I'm going to do it in a timeline so you can see how the correlation of the explosion of this disease has subsequently resulted in an explosion in our treatment options. Insulin's almost 100 years old. Started being used in 1923. And then you can see we have a 33 year gap bet between then and when the drugs sulfonylureas came out. These are medications like glipizide, if you're familiar with that. We don't use them much anymore because they have a lot of side effects, mainly causing low blood sugar, and we just have better treatment options out there. Then there's another 30 year gap 30-ish year gap, um, until the development of metformin. Excellent medication. Almost every diabetic is on this medication, and they should be. Then, if, so you got 60 years where you have the development of about three drugs. 
And then from 95 till 2013, you have the development of all these new drugs. So I'm not going to read them off to you. This, it's not necessarily important. But you have injectable medicines besides insulin. You have oral medicines um, that all work in different ways. Remember, we talked about diabetes has multi or multiple factors associated with it, the body resisting insulin, the body not producing insulin, um, too much glucagon being produced, because raising blood sugars artificially. All these medications target all those different areas. So we're not just, um, not just like slamming the pancreas to crank out more insulin, or we're not just like pushing more insulin in, which does work, but it's not necessarily targeting a lot of the underlying issues. So like I said, diabetes is multifactorial, therefore our treatment has to be multifactorial. And the key being is how we live our lives. That's the key in, the, in treating this. There's medications, we sometimes need to use them, and they help, and we use them when we need to, um, but living our lives in a healthy way is the key. We have an awesome diabetes prevention program through our hospital, and um, I'm gonna not talk too much about that, um, and we have some uh, people in the back to tell us more about that, or you can get more information, and they have an awesome program themselves, um, some of whom their slides I stole. Um, but uh, I send a lot of people this way, and I tell a lot of my patients about this. In fact, I told a guy about it today. Um, this prevention program has been studied um, against placebo, which clearly didn't do anything to change people's diabetes, and against medications only, which resulted in a 31% re risk reduction of developing diabetes. And um, the most benefit with prediabetics was found with um, lifestyle modification, so changing how you eat and changing how you move, and even better risk reduction in the over 60 crowd. So again, this is looking at the results of people with prediabetes engaging in lifestyle changes in order to prevent themselves from becoming diabetic. It works. Their goals are fairly simple. Um, Looking at moderate weight loss, 7 to 10% is a great starting point for most people and can result in huge changes. And then getting physical activity up to 150 minutes a week, which is kind of the minimum recommendation that the uh, CDC has put out for us. So lifestyle modification falls into three categories, eating better, moving more, and reducing our, <coughs> reducing our stress. So eating well. There's an interesting article that came out in the New York Times in uh, July of this year. And they looked at 50 different foods that people most search in Google. And they said, is X healthy? So is cheese healthy? Is wine healthy? Whatever. And they looked at the 50 most searched foods. And then they polled dietitians, so experts, and the, just the general public. And they said, what do you think? Is this healthy or not? And then they compared the results. So the top left category is foods that both of those groups thought were unhealthy. Hamburgers, beef jerky, diet pop, white bread, chocolate chip cookies. OK, none of these should be a staple of your diet. <laughs> foods that both groups agreed were healthy. Apples, oranges, oatmeal, chicken, turkey, peanut butter, baked potatoes. I would argue the baked potato one, actually, because it's pretty starchy. And I don't know anybody that doesn't put a whole bunch of junk on a baked potato to super unhealthify it. But the rest of it is produce, whole grains, lean meats, and nuts. So I can get on board with that. OK, things that the general public thinks are healthy, but the dietitians disagree with. Granola bars, coconut oil, frozen yogurt, granola, slim fast shakes, orange juice, and American cheese. There's a common thread between granola bars, Frozen yogurt, granola, slim fast shakes, and orange juice. Anybody want to take a guess? Sugar. Yeah, absolutely. That's why these things aren't as healthy as we think they are. The American cheese, I don't even know that that's cheese. I think it's like cheese flavored <laughs> yellow rubber. So I don't, that shouldn't even be a food. Um, and then the, the coconut oil has lots of touted health benefits in the, in the internet and people claiming to be health experts. I think the jury's out on that. I, I'm not going to necessarily come down on one side or the other. This is interesting. Foods that uh, were considered healthier by experts, but not necessarily by the public. Q 
quinoa. Does anybody not know what quinoa is? It's a, it's a whole grain. Um, it's cooked like rice. You boil it. I would describe it as like a mini fluffy rice ball, like, and it's packed with protein, and it's yummy. Uh, tofu, sushi, hummus, wine in moderation, okay, uh, and shrimp. So this is things that the dietitian said, yeah, these are good for you, and the general public said, I'm not so sure about that. And then this is, these are, this is the controversial section, things that both um, populations were unsure if they were healthy or not. Popcorn, I would say popcorn is healthy as long as you don't put a bunch of junk on it, um, like super, like a bunch of salt and butter and stuff like that. Um, but as it, just popcorn by itself is a whole grain, so can be can be a good snack. And then you got pork chops, whole milk, steak, and cheddar cheese, all of which are animal products, all of which are high in saturated fat. And I think the reason that this is controversial is because the jury on saturated fat has started reassembling and debating whether or not this is something that is okay for us or not. Um, I think it's, I, I, I don't come down hard on one side or the other. I tell my patients it's okay to have some of it in their diet and um, I'm starting to re-examine some of the literature myself. There's an interesting correlation, not a causation necessarily, but for years and years, like since the 50s, we've been told that saturated fat is the devil. and by and large, Americans have been listening to that and decreasing their saturated fat intake. But still, you saw those slides. Our rates of obesity are going up. Our rates of diabetes are going up. Again, this is just correlation. It's not necessarily causation, but I think it's interesting to consider. I had steak earlier this week, by the way. <laughs> okay, we used to have old food pyramids and junk like that that has been tossed out because bread and starches used to be the base and the most important part of the food pyramid, but again, nutrition, I want you guys to think of nutrition as a sand dune. It's shifting, it's moving, we're always learning new things, tossing out old ideas, grabbing onto new ideas, and so you can't ever um, guarantee forever that something is gonna be in one category or another. I guarantee you that produce is always gonna be good, so you can quote me on that. So this is the, the newest government recommendation, and it's pretty darn good. Half of the plate is produce. Notice that, fruits and vegetables. The grains are brown, representing whole grains, so not white stuff. And then protein is a generic protein. So I'm all about a variety of protein, not necessarily one category or the other. And dairy, which is also good for us. Fruits and vegetables, I tell my patients, if you've heard me talk before, it's hard to get too much of this stuff. It's super good for us, has a lot of nutrients in it, Vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, fiber. Okay, what's not to like there? And they taste good, so come on. Whole grains, um, why are they good for us? Why, why, why are these so important? They've been shown to decrease our risk of heart disease and stroke, lower blood sugar and cholesterol. They keep us full longer, okay? Our body's not processing it like that, like a bag of potato chips, okay? If you're eating more whole grains, it's gonna digest slowly, it's gonna release slowly, and it's more even and nicer for the body. I encourage a variety of meats and proteins. Um, again, I said I'm not anti-red meat. I'm not super strict on uh, where you should be getting your protein and your fat, but it needs to be a variety, not just hanging out in one category, okay? So you got your poultry, your fish, your red meats, eggs, nuts, beans, I'm a huge fan of nuts. I probably eat them every day. There's a big jar of them sitting on my desk and that's what I snack on all the time. So I said that the saturated fat thing is, is becoming controversial these days. Um, I'm still of the mindset that um, fats from plants are, are healthy fats. So your avocados, your nuts, your olive oils, stuff like that. Um, I probably eat these and cook with them on a daily basis, I, if not, um, you know, most days at least. And then no trans fats, we're going to touch on that here. Trans fats are like scientifically engineered garbage that we should not be eating, okay? So, and you have to check labels. 
even though it says there's no trans fats, if you're reading stuff like partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, which sounds like a science experiment, it's not good for you, okay? So we're, even though we should be able to trust what's on the shelves, we also are responsible for what we put in our bodies. Skip the sweetened drinks. I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, if I could rate for you the evils that we do to our bodies when I'm talking to patients, excluding like hard drugs and stuff. Number one would be smoking, number two would be excessive alcohol, and number three would be sweetened beverages. I'm, I'm serious on that. There was um, a good study done on a large group of nurses looking at those who consumed uh, a lot of sugary drinks, meaning one or more per day, and those who didn't consume many, many at all, so less than one per month, okay? So you have these two groups, high users, low users. Their rates of diabetes are substantially different. The uh, female nurses who consumed one or more sugary drink per day, 83% higher risk of developing diabetes than those who barely consumed it at all. That's a huge, huge difference. This is a great slide. Um, so on the left, we have regular Coca-Cola. On the right, we have 100% apple juice. Healthy, right? Apple juice from a fruit. I don't know if you can see this or not, so I'll read it for you. An eight ounce serving of uh, regular Coca-Cola has 27 grams of sugar. An eight ounce serving of apple juice has 27 grams of sugar. How good is juice for us? Not very good. I include juice when I talk to people about getting rid of sugary drinks. And I grew up in a family that drank orange juice every single day from breakfast, and I don't drink it at all anymore. I also am um, a big stickler with parents about drinking juice with their kids. We don't need it. We honestly don't. I mean, can you have it every once in a while? Sure. And I should say to you, another thing I tell patients is there's no, no such thing as a forbidden food. So um, I used to love Mountain Dew. I have one every year on my birthday, okay? So there's no such thing as a forbidden food, but it, it shouldn't be a regular part of our diet. There's, there's no reason we need to drink juice because People will say, well, it's got, it's got lots of good vitamin C in it. it got lots of vitamins in it. You know what else has vitamins? The actual piece of fruit, okay? And so we don't, we don't necessarily need this stuff. And back to the thing with parents, I think what that does is it, it trains kids' palates to only want sweet things or think that everything that they drink needs to have a flavor. And so then I get patients in, in my office who are 45 years old and they don't know how to drink water because it doesn't taste like anything. Well, of course it doesn't, it's water, but it's like the best thing you can drink. So our son is two years old. When he goes to daycare, they know that he doesn't get juice. He doesn't drink it at our house. And this is him eating blueberries by the handful. That kid gets tons of fruit, so he doesn't, he doesn't need juice. All right, I'm off my juice soapbox. Okay, uh, so next, our next thing is moving more in our lifestyle modification. The Diabetes Prevention Program has been successful in helping people achieve, uh, or helping about half their people achieve a weight loss goal, which is awesome, but even more awesome, they've helped almost three-fourths of them achieve their activity goal of 150 or more minutes per week. So this is an interesting uh, little picture I found that, that uh, goes along with that. People think that being more active is hard, but what's hard is what we do three, four, five, six, seven times a day is put food in our mouths, okay? Changing our, our eating habits is, is much more difficult. So um, back to the activity. Why is activity good? Everybody knows it's good, but can we pinpoint actual reasons why it's good? On the left is what it prevents and, or what it, does and then on the right is how it does it. So decreases our risk of diabetes, decreases our risk of obesity, treats obesity, treats di I mean, it treats all this stuff too. Reduces high blood pressure, reduces our risk of heart disease and stroke, osteoporosis, cancer, and depression and anxiety. And how does it do that? It improves our body's use of insulin. It burns excess calories. It improves our muscle strength. It increases our bone density. It lowers our blood pressure. It improves our cholesterol, it increases our energy levels, <clears throat> and it reduces our stress. If this was a label on a medication, would you take it? 
Absolutely. Be the number one best-selling medication of all time. So there's tons of activities that we can do, and I often get the question, what's the best exercise I can do? Like, what should I be doing every single day? And I tell people, the best exercise you can do is the one that you're gonna do consistently. It's the one that you like. It's the one that you enjoy. So you don't have to be a runner. You don't have to be a swimmer. You don't have to be whatever. You have to be whatever you wanna be as far as activity. If it gets you moving, if it gets your heart rate up, and it makes you sweat, that's what you do, okay? There's lots of activities that we don't always think about that are also important, right? Our day-to-day -day activities. And there's some stages in life that you get in for whatever reason that getting into a daily workout necessarily is not possible, either from a time standpoint or a financial standpoint. It's just not working out for you. So incorporate activity into your life and remember those things that can get you going. So walking, parking farther away at the grocery store, doing your yard work, playing with kids, climbing stairs, taking the stairs instead of the elevator, vacuuming your house, washing your car, hiding your remote. Strength training is important too. Aerobic activity is super important, but so is strength training. Everybody in this room is over the age of 30, including myself. After the age of 30, our fat mass increases, our lean muscle mass decreases, unless we do something about it. So if we weigh the same from the age of 30 to 50, but we haven't been maintaining any strength, we're in much worse shape than we used to be. Anybody heard this phrase, sitting is the new smoking? I don't know that it's quite that bad, but it's bad. Like, we're, we're just an inactive population. How many of us sit for the majority of our day, either at work or whatever we're doing? I sit a lot, but I try to stand at my desk as much as I can to offset that. Burns more calories, it puts me in a better posture, keeps me more alert. There's a lot of benefits to this. So again, this goes back to incorporating movement and activity into our daily lives. Back to what I said, the activity that you're gonna do is the one that you should do. Make it fun, make it enjoyable. Some people see, see uh, exercise as a, as a curse word, the E word, it's not. It should be, some. think of it as movement or activity, whatever, use whatever words you want, but. We're designed to move, we were made to move, figure out a way to do it that you enjoy. Sleep and relaxation, why is this important? Because stress increases our blood sugar, okay? And our bodies were designed to do that. So if you're running away from a bear, that's stressful, right? And you're gonna want more blood sugar in your stream because your muscles need blood sugar to get your butt away from the bear. If you're going into a big interview with a boss or something like that, your blood sugar is gonna rise because your stress is up, but guess what, needs, guess what needs food? Your brain, so that you can think, talk, articulate, and be on top of your game. <clears throat> so that's how we're designed. But if we're stressed out outside of situations where we don't need to be stressed out, if we're constantly on edge, our blood sugar is gonna go up with that too, and that's not good. So again, it's like a, it's our fight or flight system is always on, and that's not, it's not good for us. Sleeping well, that's important too. We had a professor in med school who would, before exams, he would remind us to think like the astronauts because astronauts are required by NASA to get eight or more hours of sleep. And he would tell us, get your sleep instead of cramming all night. I can't say that I always did that, but I tried to adhere to his recommendation as much as possible. So after all this possibly demoralizing or depressing news, however you want to look at it, or maybe it's encouraging to you. Can, you, can we change this? Can we, can we prevent it if we're not diabetic? Can we treat it if we are diabetic? And the answer is yeah, we can. And we can do it with and without medications. I've got a, one of my patients here today, one of my all-star patients. Dale, can you just raise your hand and say hi? So Dale was kind enough to come to my lecture today, or tonight, um, as a, as a model citizen of what can happen if you, if you put your mind to it. He came to me like nine or 10 months ago and his blood sugar was crazy out of control. His A1C, I don't even think it was accurate when we read it in our office because it was so high, so I don't think our machine could even read it. And his blood pressure was high and uh, he and his wife came in and I was like, we're gonna have to put you on two, three medications to get this under control. 
And uh, he said, and he and his wife were adamant about not, he's like, I, I want to make changes. I don't want to be on medication. And I said, I completely respect that, and I want you to make changes. But I said, we, please, please just let me put you on one medication because I, I do not like how high your blood sugar is. And he said, no, I'm not doing it. I said, okay, that's fine. So he came back to me, and I got your stats written down over here. He came back to me a month later and had already lost 15 pounds, and his blood, sugar, or his, uh, blood pressure was normal. Okay? So no longer is he in the blood pressure medication zone. And he's already on his way to making changes. Um, and, that was, and then he came back three months later, which is a pretty typical follow-up time. And at that time, he had lost 21 pounds, and his blood sugar was under control uh, as, a, as a diabetic. We want that, that A1C number that we were talking about, his, we want that to be under 7 as a goal. His was 6.7, coming down from about 14 or more. He completely flipped his lifestyle around, completely changed how he ate, started exercising more, and he said, forget the medication stuff, I don't want it. And he has lost even more weight than that. His blood sugar continues to be under control, and it's been, we're coming up on a year now that he's been like that. So, yeah, clap for that, that's awesome, right? <laughs> so I brought Dale along as a, as a a bit of encouragement for everybody to say this is treatable, it is preventable if we, if we get on board and do the right things. And um, he's going to hang out a little bit. We're going to have plenty of time for questions if people want to uh, mosey over and chat with him about how he did that. So as a primary care doctor, I just want to encourage everybody if you, if you have diabetes, talk to your primary care doctor. If you have risk factors or are worried about it or you have no idea what you're situation is and you're concerned about it, please talk to your primary doctor about it, okay? It's important and like I said, we can get on top of it early and we can make changes. Also, uh, the ladies from our diabetes prevention program are in the back with tons of good material and tons of good advice and um, yes. And you guys have dates for your upcoming meetings and stuff? Okay, so please talk to them. They're an awesome resource. And um, I think we can wrap up and take questions now. So the question is regarding artificial sweeteners and will they, um, will they increase blood sugar? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. I don't, I don't know the full truth on them either. I don't know if anybody does. Um, and when patients ask me about should I drink diet pop versus regular pop, I'm like, well, you shouldn't drink either one if, if uh, you know, I could have my way. Um, I tell them I know for sure that drinking a, a 12 ounce beverage with two cups of sugar in it is gonna be bad for you. And I, I'm pretty sure that drinking the fake stuff all the time is bad for you. Um, and I've heard also what you heard that anything sweet, regardless if it has calories or not, will trigger an increase in blood sugar. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's true or not, um, but I don't, think, I don't think a lot of that stuff is good for us. I really don't. I, again, back to the no such thing as a forbidden food. Can you have it every once in a while? Yeah, sure. But I, I seriously wouldn't make it a regular piece of my diet. I encourage a lot of my patients that I'm not, I don't get any money from these people, but I encourage them to drink LaCroix water. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. It, it comes in like crazy colors. There's nothing bad in that stuff. It's carbonated water. Uh, with natural flavors and no fake sugar, no real sugar. Um, if you're used to super sweet stuff, it'll taste weird to you, but I like it and it's a good alternative to drinking pop. Yes. Yeah, stevia is a, it's another, um, I guess, natural sweetener, if you will, because it's derived from a plant. Um, I guess intuitively it makes more sense to me that that would be better than your um, aspartame or your sucralose, although technically sucralose is derived from sugar, but whatever. Um, so intuitively it makes more sense to me that that would be a better alternative as far as fake sweeteners go. Um, I, I can't tell you for sure that you should be like using it all the time or anything, so. Oh, sorry, the question is about uh, unsweetened coffee or tea. Um, I love coffee, by the way. Um, I drink it every single day, and that is, I will fully own that addiction. Um, 
But yeah, it's the sweetener that gets us in trouble. So if you're drinking it black, there's actually good antioxidants in tea and coffee. And when people drink coffee and tea, I don't necessarily have a problem with the caffeine content. The issue that we run into when we drink too much of that stuff is that we're not drinking enough of this. We're not hydrating then, and it's, we're dehydrating ourselves. Yes? Mm -hmm. So, sorry, I'm not repeating questions. Her, uh, the first question was about uh, meatless products or like meatless bacon or stuff like that. And I, t to be honest with you, I don't know the answer to that. It would, yeah. So I, I don't know the answer to that. I think it would depend on what the product is, and I'd have to tell you individually by the label. That's, that's where um, our dietitians and other resources come in really, really handy for that. And then your other question about, um, sorry, remind me again. Boost, yeah, so, so we had the thing about the Slim Fast and how it's high in sugar, and a lot of those types of drinks are high in sugar. Can you use them, if, if you're truly using them as a meal replacement, I guess that's one thing, um, and then we have other people who, you know, they have issues eating, and so that's their only form of nutrition, so that's one thing. Again, we're responsible for what we put in our bodies, just like athletes are responsible for what they put in their bodies, and they're like, I don't know, I didn't know it had testosterone or steroids in it or whatever. Um, you can't say, I don't know if it has sugar, I don't, have, I don't know if it has fake sugar in it. We got, we got to read labels. We're responsible for that. So, yes? So the question is about orange juices that are like pure fruit or have all the pulp in them and not made from concentrate, that kind of thing. And are they as bad? They're not as bad, um, but do we need them all the time? No, we don't. Because if you think about how much orange, how many oranges it takes to make a, a full glass of juice, I mean, you're talking about like three oranges. Like who sits down and eats three oranges? That's a lot. Um, so, I mean, if, if you're throwing the whole actual piece of orange into a juicer and blending that whole sucker up and you're getting all the fiber in there, then yeah, you're probably fine. But that's not really what's happening. So, is it is it absolutely as bad as pop? No, it's not. But I just wanted to make the example that the sugar content in there is so much higher than everybody realizes. And so to be drinking juice every day is not a good recommendation. So. Basically what you're saying is there's not a good Yeah. They're all the same. Sugar, sugar, any way we look at it. That's, that's true. So uh, the point was made that there's not necessarily good sugar versus bad sugar. You could make that argument, um, but I would, I would argue that um, eating a piece of fruit with the same amount of sugar as a chocolate bar is way a uh, way better option because you, you get so many more nutrients, fiber, um, and it's a real food. It wasn't manufactured. But our insulin, our insulin. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So the, the, the question was, is our body going to react to that sugar the same way? And I think by and large it does. I guess I shouldn't say that for absolute sure, but I, I don't have any reason to suspect otherwise. Yeah. So there's another one over here. Yeah, so the question is, are certain, certain types of blood types um, more susceptible to reacting to other types of, certain types of foods? I don't know how much validity there is to that, to be honest with you. I haven't seen like a, a good solid study that has looked at that, um, and, and so I don't, know, I don't know how much stock I would put into that. I think it's, honestly, a lot of it's a trial and error basis based on who you are. So some people, some people have a dairy sensitivity, but they're not like allergic to dairy necessarily. I can't tell them that they are or are not sensitive to dairy. I don't know, I don't feel they're bloating when they have cheese, right? But, um, so if they don't wanna have dairy, that's fine because they don't feel well. But um, to, to be able to study that, I haven't really seen a good, good study to, to say that there's validity there. Okay, the, the follow-up question was, are certain types of blood also more at risk of developing diabetes? I've not seen anything that says that, so. It, it may be so, but I've not ever seen anything that says that. It's not anything I ever talk to people about. Yeah. So we don't we don't test blood types or anything like that on a regular basis. Yeah. You, and you're saying that based on your personal experience. Yeah. yeah. So what Dale's saying is that his personal experience has been when when he has had something that's processed versus something that is uh, more real food. So like something that came in a box or a can versus that something that came off the produce shelf that his blood sugar was adversely affected um, in a lot of those situations. So that's based on his personal experience, um, noticing process versus more fresh, real food. So good, good point. Yeah? To some degree, 
So um, this gentleman said he saw something or read something about six months ago that said 80 to 90 percent of the of the carbs that we eat get converted into uh, sugar in our bodies at the same rate as if you ate a tablespoon of sugar. Is that am I summarizing that correctly? So I, I don't I don't know if that's true or not. I didn't I didn't read that or I haven't seen that. Um, but I wouldn't doubt it because we eat so much um, white fluffy stuff. And if you're if you're a patient of mine, you've heard of the white fluffies because I talk about it with everybody. And that's white bread, white rice, white pasta, white potatoes, and white tortillas, like any white piece of carb that you can get your hands on. And so much of our, our diet is based on that. If you go out to eat, it's you have to like ask special for any whole wheat product almost. And my understanding is all, almost all the fiber has been removed from the white stuff. Right, so the white stuff doesn't have the bran, it doesn't have the fiber, so you're losing nutrients and fiber, which is the stuff that is so good about um, whole grains. So, yeah. Yes? Great question. So the question is, is somebody who has type 2 diabetes, um, is struggling with weight and obesity, is on medication already, can they lose weight and get off of medication? The answer is yes, absolutely. And that's, that's why we monitor the A1C. That's our, that's our barometer on how things are doing. And I've had patients who, um, as they improve and, and make changes, their A1C goes down and down and down. And I'm like, hey, I don't think you need some of this stuff. I'm like, let's get rid of this and let's see how you do and come back and yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the question is about the medication Genuvia. It's one of the newer drugs and it's a, it's a good one because it, I, I don't know if I can answer your question specifically, but it, yeah. it's, it's a... Well, I've read something about it and I don't remember exactly how it went, but it was supposed to uh, prep your food for the drug. Yeah, it, um, it's, remember we talked about earlier that slide with all the four arrows talking about the different things that are going on in diabetes. and. It, instead of in, instead of old medications that would just like pretty much squeeze the pancreas and say, hey, just make some more insulin, it really targets um, like our tissue sensitivity and our liver's ability to process sugar and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a good medicine, yeah. That's a great question. I was really hoping somebody would ask that. And so this question is about what what's uh, what's the consensus on gluten, um, and Maybe I'll offend some people, but I'm, I'm not above that. Um, the, the, the stuff about gluten, um, I think, in a lot of ways, has gotten blown out of proportion, but it's a real issue at the same time, okay? So there's a small subset of the population who is truly allergic to the protein gluten, and it's a protein that's in bread, a lot of bread products. It's from wheat. So, and there's a blood test that you can do. It says, are you, are you allergic to it? Are you not? If you're truly allergic to gluten, then every time you eat it, you are damaging your colon and increasing your risk of inflammatory issues and colon cancer in the future. Okay, so it's, it's a legit issue. There's also a um, su subset of people who are what we call gluten sensitive. And then I think that's a real thing. They, they, they have tracked in their bodies how they feel when they have gluten in their system and they say, hey, consistently, when it's in my system, I don't feel as good. I'm more fatigued, I'm more bloated, I'm more achy, whatever their symptom may be, okay? And again, who, I'm, I'm not anybody to tell them that they don't feel that way. The vast majority of people is not an issue. They, they're not allergic to it. They don't have a sensitivity to it. Um, and so I, it's, not, it's not the new saturated fat, it's not the new smoking, it's not anything. It's, um, it's a problem for some people, but for most people, it's okay. And again, um, I, e eating carbs in moderation is is important in general. So, does that help? So, more of a follow-up statement is that she's talking about a book called Wheat Belly, which I've heard of. I've not read it, um, and how it said a lot of our a lot of problems that have been happening in our country have been increasing with the increasing amount of gluten consumption. Um, I don't want to poo-poo the book completely, but like you can write a book about anything you want and claim anything you want. And I don't, I don't know who wrote it. Maybe they're very well qualified and everything. Um, but, and then for you personally, you said that you lost weight by cutting out some gluten in your diet. Um, and that um, gluten is, or 
Uh, let me back up. So maybe you did, or you did. Sorry, I'm not saying you didn't. Um, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm curious as to how much of that is just eliminating bread products in general. Because when you go on low gluten or no gluten, you're, getting, you're just getting rid of a lot of bread products because, frankly, you either can't eat them or when they're gluten-free, they taste like crap. So um, there's, there's lots of ways to, and, and we don't need a lot of bread in our diets. And, and there's other ways to get whole grains besides, or sorry, other ways to get fiber besides whole grains, like your fruits and vegetables, okay? And so you can, you can do like a, a lettuce wrap or like I've even made like burritos with like uh, Swiss chard, like those giant leaves that you can get. And you just wrap stuff up in there. And you can make sandwiches with, I cut out a picture um, in here, but there's a, you can make like sandwiches with cucumber slices or, you know, um, pepper slices or whatever. You can get really creative. And so do you need a lot of bread? No, you don't necessarily to be healthy. But if you're, if, when we do eat it, that's when we need to eat whole grains. So, yeah, awesome. Um, the question is about what, what is high glycemic versus low glycemic foods. And I first heard about this, gosh, it was over 10 years ago when I was uh, studying nutrition in undergrad. And uh, high glycemic foods are foods that our body processes real quick and then comes down real quick. So our metabolism spikes and our metabolism drops. Low glycemic foods are foods that our body gradually digests and then gradually comes off of. So your high glycemic stuff, stuff that takes longer to digest, usually higher in fiber and, and better for your blood sugar, okay? It's not, so like a Snickers is gonna spike your blood sugar and drop your blood sugar. A, um, an apple will raise your blood sugar a little more gradually. It's got more fiber to it and then drop it a little more gradually. So anything that's whole grain versus wheat, um, any of your nuts and um, fruits, vegetables, that stuff. Fruits, fruits not as much as vegetables because they're higher in sugar, but in general, that's what high glycemic means versus low glycemic. So, and, and we want to focus on eating more uh, low glycemic foods. Yes. Cool. Uh, this gentleman in front said that he was eating steel cut oats, which are a great source of uh, fiber, a great whole grain, um, eating them regularly with um, fruit and some supplements and uh, really improved his blood pressure. So that's another good um, you know, personal story about what changing we can do with uh, how we eat. I don't, I don't know necessarily. So uh, this gentleman's question is, uh, he was diagnosed as being pre-diabetic. His doctor said, hey, lifestyle modification, you need to get on top of this. And he's lost 15 pounds, he said, awesome. Um, and still noticing a lot of fluctuation in his blood sugar, even including when it's fasting in the morning, um, being higher than when he went to bed. And does, does that necessarily mean he's like doomed or anything like that? I don't necessarily think that's the case. Um, it, like, like we talked about that type two diabetes is multifactorial. So either like your body not recognizing insulin or your body producing too much of its own, like being kind of on overdrive. Um, with the, when your blood sugar goes down and then overcompensating, that could be what's happening. And so, um, you know, some, sometimes different things need to be done, even when uh, weight loss goals have been achieved. Um, maybe it needs to be more, maybe it needs to be done a different way. So um, it's a good observation. I would definitely talk to him more about that and see what his recommendations are. Yeah. So the question is, um, going back to what's the difference between diabetes and pre-diabetes? Ronnie, do we have a time limit or can we just take, keep going with questions? I'm fine with that, okay. I'm getting there. It's, it's really, it comes down to the A1C, uh, which is the three month average of blood sugar. We'll get there, there we go. So I go over this with my patients when I make a diagnosis so that they understand where we're at. So this is your normal, okay? This is, these are percentages. The numbers are all relative. So this is your normal range where uh, we want people to fall. And then you have diabetes, which is anything over six and a half. And then pre-diabetes is in between at 5.7 versus 6.4. <clears throat> so a lot of times what happens in my office is somebody comes in, I've done a, for a full physical or blood pressure visit, 
and uh, it's the first time I've seen them or first time I've gotten blood work on them and they have a fasting sugar that's above 100. Anybody that has a fasting sugar above 100, I get an A1C on them in the office. It's a finger poke test, okay? And then based on where they fall, that's my diagnosis because it's not a one time like, like I said, like I could mow down on candy bars and it would make my blood sugar crazy high, but that doesn't mean I'm diabetic. That just means my blood sugar is spiked because of what I just ate. That's why we use the three month average with the hemoglobin A1C to tell us where somebody has been over the last three months and then that gives us a diagnosis. And then to follow up your question, can you get out of that? Yes, absolutely. Dale has done it, he's not. I mean, I'm, I'm always gonna classify somebody as being diabetic once they've been diagnosed because one, I never wanna forget about that diagnosis and I don't want any other doctor who sees their chart to forget about that diagnosis and not know what they're at risk of. He's way above 6.5. In the hospital, they said it was, you mind if I share your numbers? In the hospital, they said he was 11. On our meter, they said he was, again, I don't, I don't believe my meter because our meter, I th our, it should top out at 14 and say just above 14%. It said he was 17%. I don't know if, that's, if it was that high. It was way too high is the bottom line. And uh, your last A1C was 6.2. Um, yeah, you could, um, don't go on insulin. <laughs> the, sorry, the, the question was, uh, a friend of hers said you could gain a lot of weight going on insulin. Um, I, I don't, uh, to be honest with you, I don't have a lot of patients who are on insulin because, uh, we're successfully treating it with lifestyle and with better medicines. Yeah, insulin will always control your blood sugar. Like you can eat cake all day and control your blood sugar as long as your insulin is on target. But that is not a good way to go. The question is about the A1C. It is the last three months. So to further explain this for those of you who are interested, the A1C is based on the blood sugar content attached to the red blood cell. The life of a red blood cell is um, 90 days approximately. And so that's why it gives us a, that three month average. So it's, it, it, is, it is the last three months. Red. Uh, I, sleep, I sleep better after a glass of wine, too. Just one. Yeah. So, no, the, the question is... Four ounces, not a ball. Yeah, yeah. No, so I, I don't... I don't... In the, I guess the question or comment is about wine at night. Um, I mean, yeah, a, a drink will put you to sleep a little quicker or make you feel a little, a little more drowsy, but... As far as quality of sleep, I, don't, I absolutely don't recommend alcohol for a sleep aid at all. In fact, when people are having sleep issues, I commonly ask them if they're having anything to drink within the hour before they go to bed. If it doesn't affect your sleep, I'm not going to tell you not to do it, but um, I, I definitely would not recommend that as a sleep aid. So, all right. Uh, I'll, st I'll stick around if people have a few more questions. Again, please talk to our diabetic educators in the back. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out.